the coordinator of this session, uh, as you all know, is uh, Michael Nacht. Uh, Michael is uh, the dean of the. Oops. Aha. Michael's the dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Um, and uh, before moving to Berkeley, he was the dean of the uh, School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Um, in the intervening period, he was the chief strategist, uh, get that, for the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency during the Clinton administration. Uh, let me turn the proceedings over to Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is the first panel of the afternoon. And uh, <clears throat> we are uh, calling this strategy and scary stuff. Uh, this is really a special treat for me, and I think it will be for you, to hear from three truly eminent figures. I, uh, their bios are in your program, so I won't uh, go through all of that, but just quickly, that we'll speak uh, in uh, sort of alphabetical order, Arrow, Rowan, and Wolf, and then I'd like to make some comments after that, and then we'll open it up to questions. Ken Arrow is uh, Professor of Economics and Operations Research Emeritus at Stanford, and won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1972 for his work on general equilibrium theory. Um, if you looked up eminent in the dictionary, his photo was there. Uh, Harry Rowan has combined a, a wonderful career in academia, in research, and in government. He was at the Rand Corporation for many years. He was president of the Rand Corporation from 1967 to 72. He had been an assistant director of the Bureau of the Budget in the Johnson administration. He was an assistant secretary of defense in the uh, administration of George H.W. Bush. And he also recently was a member of this small panel, the Silberman Robb Commission, that looked at the way the US intelligence community assesses weapons of mass destruction in other countries, a problem that we've had in recent years. And he is a professor of public management emeritus from the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, and also very active in their Asia Pacific Research Center. Uh, Charlie Wolf has been at RAND for a few years, a uh, Harvard-trained economist, a prolific author, dean of the RAND Graduate School for more than 25 years, really the founding dean, built it into the great institution it is today. And among many other achievements, I think one that I would like to note, which I don't see in the uh, program is, I think Charlie is, was one of the first, or perhaps the first, significant American economist who thought that the structural problems of the Soviet economy were going to lead to its collapse. And he had a lot of friends and contacts in the Reagan administration, and this was a non-trivial observation. So uh, with that, we will hear from my colleagues in the order that they are sitting here left to right. And then after my remarks, we'll open it up to questions. Professor Arrow. You can sit or stand, whatever you wish. I'd like to, sorry, I'd like to um, raise a question in the context of Tom Schelling's uh, contributions. Um, some observations on why are there wars? This, as you'll see, with the votes uh, it brings out. Uh, some of the implications both of standard game theory and of the great illuminations which Tom has brought to it. And particularly, a great deal of Tom's intellectual contributions have revolved around the study of conflict. The conflicts he has illuminated take many forms. That between an individual and his future self or selves, which has already been alluded to, between physicians and patients, say in the context of dying, between self-interest and consideration for others. And most famously, perhaps, he has considered conflicts among nations where there is at least the potential of armed war, and arms, of course, here include some very serious uh, uh, content. 
Um, he has illuminated the tactics that the parties might undertake to deter war or nuclear attack, the risks involved, the use of chance, and the gains from restricting one's own freedom of action, rather contrary to the usual bias of economists. Um, he somehow manages to find Chinese generals of thousands of years ago who understood the uh, virtues of this as well as uh, Xenophon, which I believe is his favorite quotation. Now, the contribution of game theory to these issues is, as Tom has emphasized, the point of view rather than the technical details. He remarks in the course of a characteristically lively yet careful exposition of game theory, quote, I have mentioned only some rudiments of game theory and none of the subtle or elaborate analysis that has attracted the attention of mathematics. But what may be of most interest to a social scientist is these rudiments. As Tom has shown, the real point of game theory is that you have to understand how other agents, uh, players, as they are euphemistically uh, called, will themselves react. Uh, this, whole term, this whole terminology of games with players is an interesting thing when the, when the application is to something quite different from social games, but that's uh, von Neumann's figure of speech. Um, even if there is no altruism, no extended sympathy, to use Adam Smith's terms, we have to understand how others will think and act. In particular, we have not only to think about what is best for us, but also what others will do in their own interest. Because any course of action that we take will change the environment in which others act, and so may change their actions. So therefore, it's an, a, a bit of a, uh, putting yourself in the place of the others. So this means that any participant must have what psychologists are calling these days a theory of mind, a theory of what others will do under given circumstances. Game theorists and economists in general go one step further. They find it natural to assume that any one agent will figure that the others will act as he or she would do in the same situation. By the same situation includes taking on the preferences or uh, of the others, not necessarily, you've got to identify, uh, identify yourself fully with the other. Now, it's true that detective characters like Auguste uh, Dupin or uh, Sherlock Holmes were not, did, usually did not quite agree with this view. They assumed that they were smarter than the criminals. But Sherlock Holmes, however, did allow that Dr. Moriarty was as intelligent he, as he was and planned his famous escape um, accordingly. Is temporary escape in the, in the story. Um, I think that most social psychologists, the most historians, would also differ with this fundamental postulate that the situation by itself determines the action. <clears throat> um, a fundamental characteristic of real, uh, real conflict situations is that there are usually gains from avoiding the worst possibilities. This has been brought out in the session be before lunch. They're not uh, uh, zero-sum games, which is the pure conflict situation. In fact, the very word conflict usually has a connotation that there would be some gains in avoiding it. We certainly generally think of conflict per se as bad, and of course, in most contexts, it does have negative consequences in addition to, which may, may or may not be offset by the positive consequences. There is room for cooperation then along with conflict, and it's this two-edged element that is crucial to understanding it, as well as confusing what, we can, what implications we can draw. Legal litigation comes to mind. It can be expensive to both parties in legal fees, court costs, and the time of busy people. Whatever outcome, well, whatever the outcome, it would have been better to negotiate that outcome before engaging in the legal proceedings. In this case, the word better is unequivocal. It means Pareto superior in economist jargon, better for all concerned. Now, the law and, ec and economics community has uh, recognized this issue because if people, if you're trying to apply game theory, uh, seems to imply that there's something irrational about ever going to court. Now, uh, what, what are the elements that might explain 
why court cases occur. Um, of course, uncertainty is part of the story. If everyone would, could predict the outcome, it would seem that no rational person would engage in a legal case. They know how it would come out. But it's also clear that uncertainty by itself does not resolve the issue. If both parties have the same uncertainties, then risk aversion would suggest that going to trial is even more costly to both parties. And settling for the expected outcome would be clearly dominant. So this, the mere fact that there's uncertainty as the outcome does not by itself explain why people would go to court. In fact, if anything, it makes not going to court even more attractive. And there are two lines of analysis which uh, have been applied for the seeming empirical disconfirmation of game theory and indeed of rational choice. One is that we haven't got the story right. Not only are there uncertainties, but the two sides have different pieces of information on which to condition their probabilities. You understand, of course, I'm already assuming that uh, the way you handle uncertainty, the way an individual handles uncertainty is by assigning probabilities to the different outcomes. And if you have some information, you use the conditional probability. So the probability is conditional on the information you have. Um, of course, in the game theory story, you know, you know the, the rules of the game. So you know the kind of information the other parties have. But we don't know in particular what they did observe. We know they observed the value of some variable. They know that there was an email which, if, uh, if, if discovered, will change the course of the uh, action. But they're hoping maybe it won't be discovered. Uh, now, this can be modeled in game theory terms. This is not going outside of game theory, though it's a little more sophisticated. Putting yourself in the position of the other means putting yourself in the position of all possible others. You don't know what the, uh, which identity, to use the phrase that's been used this, before, uh, this morning, um, but you know there's one of several identities and you have some probabilities and so forth. And, this does, and now, with this kind of analysis, it is possible to explain that there will be litigation. Or maybe you don't actually go to court, but you'll proceed through several st costly steps in the legal process before settlement, even though everybody knows there is a solution, but you can't agree on what it is. Uh, there is, however, a deeper conceptual difficulty with resolving conflict by cooperation. And this is a point that comes up over and over again in Tom's arguments. <clears throat> Coming to an agreement is not, in most cases, a process which can be reduced to moves in a game. Um, for Neumann and Morgenstein recognized the issue in their, in their famous 1944, uh, 1944 book by creating a separate category of games, cooperative games. In other words, you know what you could get by playing according to certain sequences of moves. You might agree beforehand on what moves to take or not to take. Um, if you know, if, if, and then work out the implications of that for the, for the two parties. In other words, the, you need to have resolve um, the problems, by, uh, the cooperative games, by, not by a rule-governed procedure of actions by the players, but by coming to an agreement as to how each should play. Now, there are many competing concepts of solutions to cooperative games. The literature is full of them. And uh, the fact that there are so many gives some idea that there is not yet one which is widely accepted. Uh, but all the proposed solutions to cooperative games, however, do tend to agree on one point. The outcome should not be Pareto inferior to another feasible outcome. When I say feasible, including informationally feasible, where you recognize, you know, consistent with the facts you know at any point. Surely it is, had, uh, surely it is held. No outcome will stand if another can be found which makes every be uh, agent better off. There's whatever kind of, of bargaining takes place. You, you, if somebody says, look, we can all be better off, you're not going to let the first one uh, stand. And this criterion, by the way, goes back at least to Edgeworth, Francis Edgeworth in 1881. It was rediscovered by Fernand Morgenstern, and then it was again rediscovered by Ronald Coase. Um, it's implicit, however, in, in an even earlier work, in Tom's, Thomas Hobbes's argument for replacing the state of nature in which every man's life is poor, nasty, brutish, and short, to replace it by a sovereign state. And his argument really is everyone would be made better off by this. 
Um, now, Tom would have and has had no difficulty in finding counterexamples to the efficiency of unrestricted bargaining. Supposing a lawsuit is brought which has no chance of winning whatever. The case will, however, impose costs on the defendant. Against the threat of a suit, the defendant may be willing to settle to avoid costs. Uh, I've been on boards of directors where, where this is the response to a stockholder's suit. Um, it's just not worth the fight. Now, so far, that if they're willing to avoid, if they're simply willing before doing anything to avoid the cost, that's still Pareto efficient. Um, but it may well be optimal for the defendant to refuse to settle if only as part of a mixed strategy or to delay the acceptance of the settlement. So there is an expected loss, an expected inefficiency. Now, there's one more aspect of modeling litigation as a game, and again, it's something which appears over and over again in Tom's writings. These are multi-stage games. So an individual, in the case of legal litigation, an individual, a plaintiff can withdraw at any time, for example. Indeed, this may justify irrational seeming behavior in the early stages, since the process will reveal further information which may change the odds. Thus, facts will come out in the course of the litigation which may change things. Now, I have introduced litigation as a surrogate analyzand for war. The parallel is not complete. It takes two to end a war, whereas in litigation, the plaintiff can always withdraw. But it's close enough. I don't recall that Tom directly discussed the outbreak and secession of wars, though perhaps I missed something. He has come close, however, in a paper on the evaluation of arms control proposals, published in 1975. It discusses there the conditions under which preferences of the parties among arms control regimes can lead to their acceptance or rejection. It is notable, however, that the Nobel lectures of both Tom and of his co-winner, Robert Ullman, did deal with the outbreak of war, or in Tom's case, of nuclear war. Ullman uh, stuck to a purely non-cooperative point of view. Um, he didn't discuss bargaining as, uh, out, outside the moves. But he added the assumption that the situation is indefinitely repeatable. This means that it's possible to introduce punishments. Um, that's to say, you can say, well, if you didn't behave the right way this time, I'll get you next time, even though it's costly to me. It does get to, um, uh, it does raise some interesting problems because by the time you get through, you find that if A uh, breaks, uh, fails to follow on the cooperative solution the next time, and, uh, and B fails to punish them the next time, then A has to punish B for failing to punish A. Now, it, 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 the game theory formalism works out, but one is a little worried about that line of reasoning. Um, Tom's lecture was rather historical than analytic. He celebrated the non-use of nuclear weapons since Nagasaki. But his explanation, or perhaps it wasn't an explanation, but a description, was the creation of an almost religious taboo, rather than rational behavior on the part of the participants. Now, the currents of war, like that of litigation, certainly seems to be a violation of collective rationality, and I'm not being very precise as to what I mean by that. Um, the, um, in fact, and the, of course, the costs of a war are far greater than the costs of a lawsuit and affect very many more people. To use the categories which have had some help in explaining litigation, there certainly is asymmetry of information or at least asymmetry of belief. Each country knows, or thinks it knows, its own strengths, whether that strength is measured in arms, military training and discipline, or simply will and purpose, feeling we just, we just won't break as fast as the other one. It may underestimate the strengths of others. This need not be, by the way, because of systematic error. When a country overestimates the strength of others, there will, there will be no war. So the, the cases where the war um, breaks out may, may be uh, indication uh, of just, the, the, just the, the, that the, you randomly fall uh, underestimate in this case. This is very much like the buyer's curse to those of you who have studied the, the literature on bidding for oil drilling rights may, uh, may recognize. Now, probably the, the question that then comes, why, why doesn't bargaining? What is negotiation? Negotiations are a frequent 
accompaniment of pre-war situations and certainly of post-war situations. So now, the, in the case of war, uh, the basic issue is that of commitment, and we all know the subtleties that Tom and others have shown with the concept of commitment. Um, a peaceful outcome, say, to a dispute over territory or power, is not just a once and for all allocation. It's a commitment to an international status. In the case of legal settlements, it may just be a payment, so it's made once, and once it's made, doesn't, you, don't, you don't need to commit to anything. But um, sometimes you do have uh, commitments uh, in legal settlements. Uh, for example, if you have, have an order that you can't build so as to block my view, then uh, this is a commitment, but the commitment is backed by an enforcing state. Now, the, inter the international field is no doubt in transition on the assertion of some degree of transnational so sovereignty, but there's a long way to go. The, the UN occasionally acts. The Europe, even within something uh, relatively restricted like the European Union, you don't have a, ge a genuine sovereignty yet, although elements are there. Hence, the need to, uh, the old expression, keep your powder dry. To, secure, to seek to secure agreements by accumulating military resources. Um, and this becomes so important and so productive of instability. Because the higher the arms, the more, the greater the reason why, well, in the circuit, at least the possibility exists that the, of, uh, of a misjudgment and with more to back it. And finally, I want to remind you that war, like litigation, is not a single move, but a process in time. Uh, World War I, I find, the, uh, offers the greatest challenge to analysis. It easy, it's easy to believe that the competent countries may well have underestimated each other's military abilities. That's possible. It's, you can call that asymmetric information or whatever you like. But after a few months, the, the, something unpredicted occurred. The trench warfare developed on the Western Front. It was clear that any gains were going to be very costly. The efficacy of the machine gun, which had not really been used widely before, and of artillery, cha changed the situation by I think anybody's calculation. Um, well, in technical language, uh, there should have been a drastic Bayesian updating, one which diminished or abolished the role of asymmetric information. After a few months, they all knew the same, they all had the same idea about their military strengths. Now, the question is why, the question that puzzles me is, um, uh, it was uh, well, like the famous dog barking at the dog at the night in one of the another in Sherlock Holmes' uh, sil story of the Silver Blaze. Um, why wasn't why didn't it happen? And the question I'm curious about, uh, that I find very fascinating, more more than curious, because it's of deep importance. Why were there no negotiations at that point? The situation the people had learned, the countries had learned differently. They realized that that at best a victory was going to be accompanied by high costs. They both couldn't be. They, they both couldn't. Shouldn't expect a victory. Uh, one of them was going to lose. Why were there no negotiations? Not even, as far as I know, the first steps to any. There was not, just nothing happened to change the situation until one side prevailed overwhelmingly, and it wasn't at all clear which one that was going to be. Fred, I don't know the answer or answers. It seems to me clear, though, that there is a concept of social solidarity here, focused on the nation state which were driving both the leaders and the led. A compromised peace was a betrayal of those who had already died in the cause. The leaders could exploit these sentiments, but they were also bound by them. Um, Samuel Bowles has recently argued, trying to explain the emergence of altruism in human beings um, uh, from an evolutionary point of view. It's argued that, in the, uh, the, uh, that the altruistic motives in the small community and these motives are essential for economic progress and social cohesion, are associated with loyalty to the community against other communities. Um, thus, the genetic basis for altruism and parochialism yielded survival value during the period of small, warring, neolithic communities. This is certainly not a proven hypothesis. But it's surely true that the willingness to kill and die for the community, for the, for the community one belongs to, is exemplified in many ways in the current world. 
Thank you very much. Michael has asked me to say a bit about uh, early days at RAND, which Tom visited to the benefit of, of those of us who were there, and I think um, to Tom's work. In any case, I met Tom then, came to like and admire him. Say a bit about the times. Enormously destructive weapons had recently been invented, first nuclear fission bombs, a thousand times more powerful than conventional weapons, and then um, <clears throat> thermonuclear ones, another thousand-fold increase. And this all happened very swiftly. Um, and weapons, some of the weapons' effects were really not known very well, especially nuclear uh, uh, radioactive fallout. It took a while to learn about it. And then there were novel delivery systems, especially long-range ballistic missiles. Uh, <clears throat> so there was a lot was changing really very fast, uh, more than I've mentioned, actually, and a lot of uncertainty about what it meant. And <clears throat> Rand was a very exciting place. It um, had uh, quite a lot of talent there in many of the relevant disciplines. I think most of the relevant disciplines were there. <clears throat> um, engineers, physicists, uh, uh, mathematicians, economists, political scientists, and so on, other social scientists. But a question, which is really kind of remarkable in hindsight, that had not been much explored uh, <clears throat> by the early 1950s, when I uh, arrived there as a young person, was um, how these weapons might be used. It was just kind of, a, in hindsight, <laughs> remarkable how little investigation there had been. Um, we got into that. We backed into some questions that, that uh, some of us did and, uh, and did some pioneering work. But it's you know, kind of late in the day, you might think, for that to be done. Um, the prevailing concept uh, was not called that except by Herman Kahn. Herman Kahn, a uh, person who's kind of boundless, actually, <laughs> What called a wargasm. That is, nuclear weapons would simply be launched, enormously destructive. That was uh, if they were used at all. Uh, and, um, and that was it. Well, that being it was not a very happy possibility. I mean, one could assume oh, there's no way this could happen because everybody would behave rationally in some sense, meaning that would never happen. But <clears throat> the... Um, should one really truly believe it was impossible? Uh, here we introduce Europe as a major factor, as perceived by us and by, uh, by the Europeans, certainly. Uh, we, we, we faced what was seen as a dire situation in Europe uh, in terms of imbalance of power, of <coughs> conventional power, with a Red Army in the middle of Germany. And at the beginning, for several years, really not much to oppose it in the West. Then NATO got created, and it changed. But this led to the doctrine of massive retaliation, formulated by John Foster Dulles, I mean, expressed by John Foster Dulles, at the beginning of the Eisenhower administration, and, um, and endorsed by President Eisenhower. And the idea was, if there was an attack, there would be massive retaliation, meaning nuclear. And... <clears throat> And this was several years after the Soviet Union had the bomb. I mean, it was a puzzle here, obviously. Uh, because on the one hand, if you thought any use of the bomb would probably lead to total destruction, on the other hand, our policy said, oh, we were going to use them first, if necessary. So you had to believe this was really going to work. <clears throat> I particularly remember Tom's essay from this period, late, late 1950s, the threat that leaves something to chance, which captured really quite well the uh, nature of the situation we were in regarding this threat to use nuclear weapons in Europe, right, related to this notion that uh, probably might not be contained. What Tom really did to help us, help everybody, I think, was to uh, uh, convey a lot of aspects are so important about control 
about the importance, implicit, explicit, of, of bargaining, of negotiations before, during, maybe after, conflict. Well, not much thought had been given to this. In fact, not, not nearly as clear thought as Tom brought to it. The, uh, <clears throat> so, um, that was a major contribution. Uh, I want to say now, and a lot of useful things were done at that time. I mean, one of the consequences of the work being done at RAND was that we really did give a big push to having a protected nuclear force. Um, this mentioned one, and, and also some things to avoid things happening by accident. Before 1958, the Strategic Air Command had, for the use, operation of his bombers, a, uh, a system whereby planes, bombers would head towards the Soviet Union, under, you know, a warning, alert being launched. Uh, and if they didn't get a word at a certain line, if they, got, they would go ahead unless they got a radio message to stop them. A, a test was run in 1957, I think, uh, this was after we said this is a really bad idea, radio is not so reliable, uh, in which some large proportion of the airplanes never got the message to come back. So don't do it that way, turn it around. They come back unless they get a signal to go ahead. It's just called fail safe. So these things were introduced. 58 it was introduced at SAC. It took about a year and a half, two years, and we started beating the drum on this one. And they had to do that experiment. And a lot was done to protect the strategic force. So you might say that problem is solved. Really, I mean, that in a sense was solved, and it helped enormously. But it wasn't good enough. And now I turn to uh, some things that I've only learned about recently. I've been out of this business for a long time, but thanks to George Schultz, I got a little bit brought up to date over the last year. Tom uh, gave a talk a couple of years ago in which he said, I think it took the United States at least two decades to learn how to think about nuclear weapons policy after 1945. Glad he put the at least in there, uh, because you can argue that we still haven't adequately to this day understood it. An example, <clears throat> at some point in the 1960s, and I'm not sure exactly when, Secretary of Defense McNamara ordered that combination locks be installed on missiles. This, uh, I'm relying on Bruce Blair here for this. This was done earlier on bombs. Some work done at RAND might have helped on this one. Combination locks were put on our bombs, air-delivered air bombs. But these Minuteman missiles were a different, in a different category. It's very hard to figure out how to do that. So the idea was that the Strategic Air Command, I mean, would have a system which involved a code having to be transmitted before it could be launched. The Strategic Air Command regarded this procedure as cumbersome. So it set the code at 0000000000. That's eight zeros. Uh, it was not changed until 1977. <laughs> uh, another example. <clears throat> I suggest we still haven't learned <laughs> enough. There <laughs> been large reductions in the numbers of nuclear weapons on both sides, both the so uh, Soviet Union, about to say, Russia and, and the United States. But I wonder how many people know this. I discovered it recently, and I think it's really shocking. Uh, both nuclear superpowers, Russia is a nuclear superpower, and so are we, have many hundreds of missiles ready to fly within a few minutes. I mean, really very few minutes. I mean, technically, they can go, both sides. A few short um, keystroke computer signals, repeated, then two keys turned at the same time, off they go. The sea-based missiles take a little longer, but not a lot longer. The number, or at least a year ago, they were about 1,300 American and 1,300 Russian warheads on high alert. I mean, it's like the Cold War is still on. I mean, why is this? Um, well, you know, <laughs> if you believe everything's under control, <laughs> We had an episode, which I mean, if you know about, last August, six nuclear-armed missiles were mistakenly moving by air from one Air Force base to another Air Force base and sat out there in the tarmac uh, for, for many hours, very unreassuring. So 
one of the things that I'm now very conscious of uh, was that there was a, a um, uh, you might say, a doctrine, an ideology with, within the, the bomber force, missile force, in, in the Strategic Air Command, which put um, highest priority to not having stuff destroyed. I mean, our stuff destroyed. Even though a significant part of it was well protected. The, the submarines at sea were always perfectly safe. And the min, min missiles, uh, very hard uh, uh, shelters. We had made a contribution on that front, too. Significant parts of it really very well protected. But nonetheless, they adopted this view, the zero, 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 zero thing, that they had to launch. Well, how could this go on for so long? Well, one of the things that we now know, and I don't know maybe if this has really ended, but maybe it has, was that the highest level of command in the country never paid much attention. Commanders in chief never really got into this topic for many, many years. Uh, so the highest authority was not saying, you got to stop doing that. You have to do something different. They would have done something different had that, that if they really persisted in it. Apparently, that never happened. And even secretaries of defense, McNamara was obviously interested enough to, to say, you've got to set up a code here, but didn't pursue it. He, he was told about this uh, recent, well, recent, a few years ago by Bruce Blair. He said, I cannot believe that this. I mean, it was just shocking. But he hadn't pursued it. So in fact, some of us are agitated for uh, having options in the use of the force which were smaller, smaller options. Now, some people say, well, that's a bad idea. In any case, we, we, smaller options, just in case, other than this kind of war gas. So other options were created. And, they, uh, and in fact, one of the people who was really instrumental in pushing this was another person who was at Rand in this period when Tom was there, Jim Schlesinger, observed at some point, they were really all big options. I mean, none of them is really, in some sense, very usable. So, I mean, that had to be worked on hard, and it wasn't worked on adequately. Some people might say it's a good thing. It didn't work on <laughs> developing really usable options for nuclear weapons, but there are two sides to that argument because something might have happened, which, anyway, then we would have bad options. So, we didn't have them. Leadership, I think, never really got in adequately engaged, so it continued more or less on autopilot organizationally. Uh, Tom has recently addressed the, t the need to reinforce the taboo against using nuclear weapons. This is a very important topic, and he has some very useful things to say about what we should do. It's really urgent because <clears throat> not only is the technology of making bombs well known, I mean, you can do a lot on the internet, but the access to materials is, uh, is, is growing and spreading around the world. And one of the consequences of response to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, is growing popularity of nuclear electric power widely. Well, co that comes with, uh, inevitably, uh, with ac closer access, really pretty ready access, actually, to bomb materials. And nobody's ever solved that problem. I mean, it's there. It's been worked on to see if there's any possible solution, uh, a, a technical solution to it, and what has not been discovered. So bomb materials look like they're going to spread. And that raises a question about the nuclear taboo you know, more widely. I mean, what can we do? Well, we can do things that he suggested, and that would be useful. So Tom has made a lot of contributions, but um, clearly some of the most important topics we've had faced in the last half century. Uh, but there's quite a lot more to be done. Thank you. The title of this panel, as you know, is, is Shelling and the Scary Stuff. Um, and Michael suggested that, uh, and, and uh, Harry has reinforced this, that the scary stuff uh, was the early years at RAND. Now, I have, uh, being a very benign person,
person myself, I have uh, trouble in construing um, Rand, the early or the later or the middle years or the current years as scary. Uh, but I wanted to be at least casually empirical about interpreting uh, the subject of the panel, Schelling and the scary stuff, uh, the early years at Rand. So I looked into the uh, uh, literary, the literature uh, database at Rand for uh, the papers that Tom had done at Rand uh, between uh, 1957 and 1968. Uh, to see if one could very crudely dichotomize them between scary stuff and non-scary stuff. That was a primitive uh, uh, dichotomy. And let me read you some of the titles from this uh, uh, time series bibliography, 1957-1968. Uh, and, and I'll just, I won't read, there are 21 of them, um, uh, attesting once more uh, to Tom's uh, prolific uh, uh, output. Um, an illustrative game in limiting war. Integrity versus pragmatism, an issue in foreign aid program design. Those both were 1957. Uh, for the abandonment of symmetry in the theory of cooperative games, Ken has already referred to that. Limited uh, central war, nuclear weapons and limited war, those are both 50, 1958. Uh, the reciprocal fear of surprise attack, also 58. The Threat That Leaves Something to Chance, Ken Arrow referred to that, that's 1959. Uh, reflections on Active Defense in the Missile Age, uh, 1960. Uh, sitting Ducks versus Decoys, the High Costs of Sack Dispersal to Large City Airfields. Uh, 61, um, an unmistakable sales pitch for crisis games, 64. And then uh, from the mid-60s through 68, six papers on models of segregation, neighborhood tipping points. Now, uh, when you make a count of these using that, that uh, crude dichotomy, scary, non-scary, um, it, it turns out, un, un, unless you interpret uh, the theory of segregation and neighborhood tipping points as scary, which in some sense it's maybe at least as scary uh, because the, the, the two models that um, are explicated in those uh, six papers that I referred to um, uh, contain a number of of, uh, of parameters uh, that in one version of the model are simulated and the other uh, at least potentially in could involve econometric estimation, involve things like the, uh, the ratio between the uh, populations, uh, the, the population components that are like oneself and that are different from oneself, the intensity of uh, latent prejudices and so forth. So, uh, but putting those papers in the non-scary category, it turns out that in those years, uh, according to my very rough count, there were uh, 10 scary papers and 11 non-scary papers. So uh, I think that, that um, uh, there's a case for, um, the Catholicity of, of Tom's uh, output, even in those uh, ostensibly scary uh, years um, uh, that ran. And, and as I uh, said or implied, 
which of the two categories is actually more scary is arguable. That is, the, the tipping points in segregation and the, and the parameters included in, in that analysis uh, uh, comprise something that might be construed as the anatomy of prejudice. Uh, and without the economic solvent that Gary Becker's uh, uh, work uh, provided, so in a, some, in, a, in a sense that may be at least as scary um, uh, as the ones relating to um, uh, nuclear weapons and, and limiting, uh, con limiting war. Uh, even one comment about the ostensibly uh, scary stuff, um, which has been alluded to and, and is reinforced in, in Tom's uh, Nobel uh, lecture, uh, uh, which is more in the field of semiotics than, than, than analysis and has to do with what Ken and, and, and uh, Harry referred to as the taboo. Um, and that is the, the symbolic significance of the nuclear threshold. Now, there were a number of people, close friends and respected uh, colleagues, notably Albert Wolstetter and others, who uh, had a really different tack and uh, with, with, I think, um, also uh, uh, salutary uh, uh, normative preconceptions underlying that different tack um, of, of blurring the line between th that threshold and uh, focusing on small weapons, controlled weapons, accurately delivered, uh, targeted precisely, and so forth, um, which had the scary disadvantage of making the use of nuclear weapons uh, more likely, but the possible operational advantage of having a uh, response uh, uh, if the first use was precipitated uh, uh, by others. There's a further question of how the nuclear threshold, the taboo, the symbolic significance of that threshold relates to so-called GWOT, the, the Global War on Terrorism, and the uh, incentives for uh, decentralized so-called stateless actors to uh, acquire uh, and assemble components of, of uh, nuclear weapons with presumably little deterrent effect on their, uh, on their both incentives to acquire and their behavior once acquired um, uh, of, of, the, of the nuclear threshold. Um, another point about Tom's work that, that hasn't been alluded to, I think whether you refer, whether one refers to the scary or the non-scary stuff and whether one uh, uses a more refined way of distinguishing among them than the, than the dichotomous uh, uh, one that I've used. Um, and I think something that's been neglected in the evaluation of Tom's work, I think Tom has been, is, one of the very best, most literate, and most fluent writers, certainly among Nobel uh, economists, not accepting those uh, uh, present or uh, it really um, an outstandingly literary uh, uh, formulator. And uh, I would say um, that extends to even noblists in literature, um, one of whom I think Harold Pinter received, uh, someone I've never been particularly enamored of, uh, <laughs> received the Nobel Prize for Literature along, I think, the same year that you did, Tom. Uh, so I, I think that, that it's worth reading, and I will read one excerpt, uh, Tom's uh, work for the, um, the elegance, the apt analogies, the clarity uh, that eschew complexity and sesquipedalian verbiage in favor of simple and familiar 
uh, wording. And l let me read one excerpt that uh, is, is typical of, rather than uh, selection uh, from many ones that would be appropriate candidates for this. Um, if I can find it. This was an uh, excerpt from a commencement address that, that Tom gave at the Rand Graduate School uh, commencement exercises in November 16th, uh, 1985. Uh, and the title of the commencement address uh, was Strategy and Self-Command, uh, something that, that Ken Arrow has alluded to uh, uh, before. The need for anticipatory self-command arises not only for the individual or the squad, but for government itself. The statutory debt ceiling, the proposed balanced budget amendment, and statutory efforts to make budget balancing automatic are well understood by families whose own efforts to live within their means leave behind a trail of good intentions and broken resolutions. Parents need, as the founding fathers needed, inhibition on cruel and unusual punishment when they lose their tempers. And the entire Bill of Rights was an effort of legislators to put some restraints on legislation beyond the reach of ordinary majority vote. So I think it is fair to say that, that not only is Tom's uh, uh, innumerable contributions to social science and to economic uh, thinking and concepts, but his um, uh, formulations and composition of text are, are exemplary, and, and um, I think that is, is one, that uh, paragraph is one example. Thank you. I'd like to offer a few of my own remarks, and then we'll open it up to comments and questions. Uh, I want to focus on really one issue, uh, po pointing to the future, not the past. And that is, how effectively can we, going forward, expect to apply Schelling's principles to policy questions that we're facing in national security? And I begin with the caveat which I think is self-evident, there are very, very, very few people as smart as Tom Schelling. Many, many more verys, very, very few, few who are in government. <laughs> so are we being unrealistic that these ideas, these theories, which are derived from incredibly astute observation, the English garden rather than the French garden, can in fact be routinely applied or applied in really important areas because we're just not smart enough to figure out how to apply them. Uh, the, uh, the days at Rand, which included Harry Rowan and Charlie Wolf, Wolstetter, Shelling, Fred Clay, Andy Marshall, Jim Digby, Dan Ellsberg, Herman Kahn, Bernard Brody, Bill Kaufman, Arnold Horlick, this is I don't know how many of you are familiar. This is the Hall of Fame of uh, US strategy. How much of Schelling's ideas were helped shape by being in that environment, and how much did that environment shape Schelling? Uh, maybe Tom can comment on that later. Uh, but some questions I really would like others to address, and Tom to address, are what are the limits of Schelling's theories? When do we know that they're not relevant? Is it a problem of understanding Schelling better? Do we need to apply Schelling more effectively, more artfully? Do we need to revise Schelling? Do we need to extend Schelling? There's a kind of comfort level with Tom's 
theories in nuclear deterrence. I'd like to talk about areas outside of nuclear deterrence. He was the essential inventor of the concept of compellence. Compellence has been a key notion in crisis situations such as the American president compelling the Soviet leader to withdraw the missiles from Cuba. But there hasn't been a lot of explication of the concepts of compellence, nearly as much as deterrence. If compellence is a future problem of ubiquity to get the North Koreans to stop their program, to get the Iranian, this is, these are issues of compellence, not deterrence. We need more work in this area. I'm giving, basically, I'm going to give Tom a homework assignment for the second half of his career. Uh, the issue of balance of resolve was often mentioned in the earlier panels. We've had big deal problems with the balance of resolve. Let me start with Vietnam. Um, there was a famous anecdote in the Paris peace negotiations of 1973 where a senior American general of the U.S. delegation uh, admonished a Vietnamese counterpart general and said, you know, I just want you to know that in 12 years in Vietnam, you never defeated us once on the battlefield. And the Vietnamese general, half the size of the American general, looked at him and said, true but irrelevant. Uh, in, in the escalation in Vietnam policy, we were led by Secretary McNamara, who read Schelling, by his top policy advisor, Bill Kaufman, who read Schelling, by McGeorge Bundy, National Security Advisor to President Kennedy, who read Schelling. Was Schelling not relevant? Was Schelling misapplied? What happened there? Henry Kissinger replaced those guys. He had read Schelling. These are people intimately familiar with Tom and Tom's work. But somehow the balance of resolve produced a different outcome than I think some in the, men, most in the United States wanted. Today, we have possibly a similar situation in Iraq. Uh, I'm not sure how many of this leadership has read Schelling. I wouldn't be surprised if Rumsfeld read Schelling. Uh, Wolfowitz definitely read Schelling. That's for certain, as a student of Wolstetter. I don't know about uh, Powell. Probably Condi Rice, I'm almost certain, read Schelling. So if the power of Schelling's ideas are so uh, enormous and so compelling, is it just that they're not applicable to these conflicts? Or what is it about the gap between the theory and the policy? We wouldn't want to have Newton here saying, well, I just do theory, but the apple actually may not fall that way in reality. That wouldn't be a very good test of the theory. And we have a situation in Afghanistan. Similarly, where you have Afghan fighters seemingly willing to literally fight for hundreds of years. That's what they do for a living. McCain has spoken about being in Iraq 100 years. He may be off one country. It, will the balance of resolve be sufficient for the United States to be in Afghan, Afghanistan for 100 years? And what about our European allies who don't want to be there for 10 minutes and have already been there for several years? We're facing potentially not problems of of a nuclear standoff between great powers, which we're facing potentially protracted conventional war conflicts as part of the current agenda. We're also facing, obviously, issues of subgroups within states that may not behave according to their government's wishes. General Musharraf claims that he didn't know that AQ Khan was selling nuclear materials to the Iranians and to the North Koreans. I'm dubious of that point, but it could certainly be the case in the future that very powerful, important, influential subgroups within states may do things that are very deleterious to U.S. policy. Do these theories apply in any way to dissuading, compelling, deterring, influencing their behavior? We have the issue of terrorists or freedom fighters, depending upon your politics. This is a non-nuclear example. 
after the Second Intifada ended, um, after Arafat's death in Israel, there was an ability to interview large numbers of the mothers of the suicide bombers of the Palestinians who went into Israel. A dominant, not the soul, but a dominant view expressed by the mothers who had lost their son, mostly sons, in suicide attacks in Israel was, I wish I had four more sons to sacrifice. Where does compellence and deterrence and commitment and signaling come into play for real policymakers trying to stop these problems? And we have nuclear terrorism. This is a real threat. We have unquestionable evidence of Al-Qaeda's interest in nuclear bombs to be used on American cities. Not to be used in Spain, not to be used in Indonesia, to be used in the United States. What mix of communication skills can we use to alter their behavior, if anything? It would seem that part of the problem is, going back to George Akerlof's earlier comments about self, we're dealing with such fundamentally different cultures than those we're familiar with, that unless we're able to translate these communication ideas into the cultures who, who are our opponents, in a way that they can understand, that they can accept, that are meaningful to them, that it may not be very effective. I'm reminded in a somewhat more pacific example, when I was in the Clinton administration, I only heard this on the side because I wasn't working in this area, but there, was, there were many ongoing trade issues and one, there were some major trade uh, issues that the US had with Japan. And I heard this uh, was somewhat ironic story at a, at a meeting that uh, a top, the US top trade negotiator, Mickey Cantor, I think, in the first Clinton administration, couldn't go to a, a particular meeting and he sent one of his deputies who, and that particular person just knew nothing about Japan, just nothing, knew a lot about trade, got the talking points, knew about the issues, but didn't know Japan. So uh, they exchanged business cards, he and his counterpart, the meeting was in Tokyo. And then the group sat down across the table, Japanese on one side, Americans on the other side. And you know, after all, these aren't really adversaries, but there were you know, tense issues in trade policy. But the American head of delegation had the Japanese delegation head's business card, and in the course of the discussion started to fidget with it and roll it up. And eventually, after 40 minutes, it was just in shreds. It was just in tiny little pieces of mini cardboard on the table. And the Japanese delegation had, I mean, it was like we had committed Pearl Harbor in reverse. He stopped the, he stopped the meeting. There was a formal demarche, a formal complaint from the Japanese foreign ministry to the State Department. They never wanted to see this guy again. Was this a symbol of a fundamental shift in US policy toward Japan? Okay, this is like showing the heel of your shoe to the wrong people in the wrong country, right? You gotta, you know, as they said in The Music Man, you gotta know the territory. <laughs> you gotta know the territory. And I'm just a little uh, anxious about the fact that we don't know the territory. We have some extraordinarily cogent and powerful ideas and we need to find ways to apply them and modify them so that we can deal with these very difficult issues and also know when we can't, when they're not applicable. Um, you know, they like to say that there are many books that are bestsellers, but that doesn't mean that a lot of them have been read. You know, it means a lot of books have been bought, purchased. So the same thing that Schelling may be on every bookshelf, but how many people have really read it? And how, you know, Carl Shapiro has read it. How many people really understand it? How many people of those people can really apply it? Uh, I think you're getting down to smaller numbers. So I know that Tom's looking for some work, and he's, you know, he's basically not doing much these days. 
just one accolade after another. So I figured I would at least be able to present a homework assignment so for the next 50 years he can, you know, really get into the action. So those are my comments. And now we open it up to questions. Mark. I thought the question you asked about why less of this stuff gets expressed in good policy was a great one. Fortunately, there's a, there's a fine social theorist who, uh, who answered that question in advance. His name's Tom Schelling. And an essay that I think is not as well known as it ought to be on organizational self-command. And I'm not going to be able to quote this quite precisely, but the key sentence says, when you see an organization behaving recklessly, it might be a mistake to conclude that it's full of reckless people. It might be so full of cowards that nobody dares to say, we can't get away with this. And that seems to me like not a bad explanation, at least of the last seven years. By the way, are there panelists who'd like to comment? I think you, at the end, answered the question about the application of various of the principles associated with Tom, who came from Tom. You have to know the territory. It's kind of a necessary condition, a prior condition. Um, I have an example from this panel I was on, on the weapons of mass destruction not being in Iraq. And it had to do not so much with the weapons themselves, but something that came out after um, Saddam Hussein was captured, and, and he, was being que he was questioned. And it turned out, and this I think is a pretty convincing story actually, that he wasn't very much deterred by the threat of the United States attacking him. His focus was very much like the famous Steinberg cartoon of the Midtown Manhattan view of the United States. You know, it's dominated by the Hudson River and the Jersey Shore and then the California. And, his way out there somewhere. and so on. He was dominated by, surprise, surprise, what was going on inside uh, his, his country, his generals, and Iran and Turkey. Those were his big concerns. Uh, the French and the Russians would take care of the Americans, he thought. And so all of this stuff that we were doing, uh, threatening him and so on, didn't have much of an impact on him. Well, could we have done better on Saddam? I think we actually, beforehand, I think we could have. We certainly didn't try very hard. <clears throat> in fact, it was just amazing <clears throat> how little we tried to figure out what was going on in Iraq. Just extraordinary how little we tr even tried. But it does, I mean, it's really necessary to know the territory before we can do much. I think actually another point I, I, I didn't get to mention, but I did, uh, which was a comment on what Brad DeLong said earlier. The, the actual policymaking process is so much more complex so what can we realistically expect from these ideas in terms of both guiding us and shaping what we should do? Just two examples. I mean, there's now literature out that LBJ told Stennis, head of the Armed Services Committee in, in 64, that he thought Vietnam was a lost cause. But the, the struggle that LBJ had in the post-Kennedy JFK era and dealing with the, the sharp Cambridge guys he had to show his muscle. Now that, I'm sure it fits somewhere in the theories, but it, it's not in sort of two-player game theory. Or George W. Bush and his relationship with George H. W. Bush, which may be the single most important consideration understanding the Iraq war. But I, I wonder, Mike, on, on this uh, uh, criterion of, of uh, uh, all the people who've read Shelling, why haven't they behaved better? Um, uh, you know, a lot of people have read uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of people have read the Koran. A lot of people have read Adam Smith, but you find, I mean, you know, we've all, but you don't don't find that the 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 folk who are sort of right-minded, as say, accord with my view um, about the role of markets and prices and competition. Uh, there are others who are supporting. I mean, Hillary or and Obama. 
I mean, I think Obama may be educable because becoming president of the Harvard Law Review is really pretty demanding. Um, but, you know, the, you can read stuff, and if you have uh, uh, a fairly uh, adequate sense of ego and uh, preconceptions that are equal to that sense of ego, then you use what you read to exemplify where you want to go and what you want to do, independent of having read Schelling or the Koran. Or, um, um, so I think that's not, that's not uh, uh, maybe an, uh, an adequate test of the uh, cogency and, and durability of Tom's work. Now, uh, Ken referred to the theory of mind uh, uh, in his earlier remarks. I, my understanding of, of uh, lately I've been reading a lot of disparate stuff, including uh, Alan Kendall's, um, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his theory of memory. And my understanding of, of where that theory of mind is going has to do with, with uh, uh, molecular biology, and that you could say that even people who've had the benefit of reading Tom's uh, work, um, and of all the people you cited, they all did, but whether they understood it all is questionable. Um, maybe their, their uh, biogenetic wiring was such that it wouldn't translate to, uh, to, uh, to affect their behavior. So I think it, it's, a, it's not maybe the, the right uh, test of, uh, of Tom's contributions that people who've read it haven't uh, behaved with the proper sense of restraint and humility. Tom, do you want to say anything at this point? Or you want to? Yeah. Two things. One, Michael, I think, was it you or who suggested that Rumsfeld may have yeah. read me? <laughs> that was a guess. Okay, I, I'll, I'll tell you the story there. Uh, recently, the most famous thing I ever wrote was published in 1962. It was a two and a half page foreword to Roberta Wolstetter's book on decisions at Pearl Harbor. Uh, I was invited to have lunch with Rumsfeld uh, it turned out that he got called up on the hill and that didn't happen and then I think we went to war in Iraq and, and the lunch never came off. But I, 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 I phoned back to ask his military aide, was this just me or a group and what, what was it about and was there a subject that I should prepare on? And it turned out that Rumsfeld was one of hundreds of people in Washington who had been reading after September 11 my foreword to Roberta Wolstetter's book. And what I'm quite sure of is that Rumsfeld thought that I wrote the book. <laughs> he referred on, on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal to that distinguished historian, Thomas Schelling. And I thought, in fact, I think at one of these uh, commencement addresses at Rand a few years ago, I, I, I told the, 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 the budding PhDs that better than writing a 260-page book was writing the two hundred, the two and a half page, page forward <laughs> to the book. Uh, pertinent to what's been going on, uh, my book called Arms and Influence, which has been referred to here, is coming out in a new edition. And they asked me to write a new preface. I said, if you'll keep the old preface, I'll write you a new one also, but I don't want to give up the old preface. And in writing this preface, I had to raise the question, do I wish that leaders in North Korea and Iran, or if not leaders, advisors or commentators or somebody, would read this book? And do I want this book to be read by terrorists, especially maybe high-tech kinds of terrorists who might get their hands on fissile material with which they could make a bomb? And I concluded, I said, not with complete confidence, but on balance, I conclude, I want them to read it. Because I want them to understand what I thought was the point of the book, as illustrated in the title, Arms and Influence. I said, I want them to know that nuclear weapons may be very good for influence, 
But to squander them by blowing up Los Angeles or Hamburg or Bali or some such place is a waste of opportunity. I want these people to understand that deterrence isn't dead, although it may be doing more for them than for us. Because while I don't relish the idea of either North Korea or Al Qaeda making demands on the US that the US has to meet, I'd somewhat rather they tried making meetable demands than simply using a few nuclear weapons to kill a few million people. And I, I, I reflect on this fact, which I think has already been commented on. If a terrorist organization should get nuclear weapons, or a few nuclear weapons, it'll probably do it by getting fissile material and hiring a team of exceptionally well-qualified scientists, engineers, metallurgists, computer scientists, and so forth, who will have to be segregated away from their jobs and their families. And what are they going to talk about every night at dinner? They're going to end up talking about what these damn things are going to be good for if we ever get them built and turn them over to the people who contracted with us. And by the time they have the bomb, they will have thought more and more deeply about what to do with nuclear weapons than any head of state will ever have thought, or even the advisors of any head of state have ever thought. And I want them to be just as sophisticated as possible so that they don't go around throwing bombs at populations, but rather have the good sense to try to figure out now that we have a capability to influence nations, now that we are equivalent to the 10th or the 11th or the 12th nuclear power because we have nuclear weapons, let's begin to act like a small state that is recognizing it has this kind of power and not squander it in an orgy of explosion. Uh, time for a couple more comments and questions. Brad DeLong. I suppose this is the moment to say that J. Robert Oppenheimer, who did do so much to build the bomb, had thought in an extraordinarily sophisticated fashion about all these issues. And yet the U.S. policy process was such that his voice did not have what I would regard as its proper weight in U.S. debates in the 1950s. Yes, Peter. Peter Dumont, uh, the Star Alliance Foundation, which is a peace education initiative. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for the privilege of being here in this elite company. And I'd like to acknowledge a couple of friends from the Russian Parliament uh, Center, kind of information center for the Russian Parliament who are here, who came to the Human Rights Conference at Bolt Hall on Friday and become friends and how important it is that, that they are here and participating and want to create some kind of similar dialogue and, and conference in uh, Moscow and have an ongoing relationship. Um, but in, in, in partial answer and possible contribution to your question, uh, Dr. Nacht, uh, what mix of communication skills can we use to alter Al-Qaeda's behavior? Um, we could start by Acknowledging that, that language is a big problem and it's not only a matter of translation, but maybe to transcend language and to do good works for the people who are the constituents and for those people themselves. And, and I've thought in recent months um, several times about paraphrasing FDR uh, and his comments about fear by saying that perhaps the greatest enemy we have to face is enmity itself. And of course, the conclusion, or the, the, the logical uh, follow-up to that, if the problem is enmity as opposed to enemies, then the solution is going to lie not in annihilating enemies, but in annihilating enmity. And, and I apologize if this seems terribly obvious to all of us here, but I think Maybe it's a useful way and an important way to communicate to uh, our political leadership, starting immediately 
and in an ongoing fashion. I'd love to hear your comments. Any comments from the panel? No, okay. Uh, well, it's the bewitching hour. We've been rather punctual for a Berkeley conference, so I don't want to break that habit. Is there someone back there? I'm sorry. Okay, one final. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yes, sir. Hold on. D -d -d I wonder if you could comment on the adequacy and quality of our investment in research on these scary topics that you discuss so knowingly. I personally think we're underinvesting in this area, but that may be a biased view. Gentlemen? I'll have one stab at it. Uh, I'm not, <clears throat> it depends on how you define areas of investment. Um, I think we have a, an institutional problem. Uh, the, I know more, a little bit more about the intelligence community since I served for a year, part-time for sure. Uh, recently, on, on that looking into that community and its uh, failure in Iraq, but it was actually a much broader look. And the 9-11 Commission, of course, did a big job. And the Senate Intelligence Committee did a lot of work, quite good work. And <clears throat> there was no question in my mind that in that case, it's not a matter of investment. <clears throat> it's a matter of, uh, of institutional structure and leadership, uh, which has really been very inadequate. And the fixes, of which there have been, been a lot of attention to it, I think are not really very adequate. Uh, <clears throat> and. I was really shocked by the recent national intelligence estimate, which naturally got spread all over the place, was made public, on Iran's weapons of mass destruction. It was really both a public part, all I know, a low quality work, and you know, blew up the president's policy towards Iran, which may, you know, might, might subsequently have been okay, but it was really a bad thing to have come out of the intelligence community. Now, there's a case where I don't, my belief is it's not a matter of the amount of money being spent. It's not the whole story of investing, investing in these scary things, I agree, but it's an important part of it. Uh, <clears throat> part of what's needed, I think, is more competition, uh, more, a structure such that there'll be more competition for, uh, for analysis, for ideas in that system. I won't go into details, I actually had a, a recommendation which got into our report, which was the first thing to disappear uh, in terms of an action item when it got to the White House. I mean, it was really just absolutely stripped out and disappeared. And, um, but that's just a, a view. So it's not just money spent, it's how it's spent. And the setup we have for doing work on some of these topics. Of course, the programs I suggested would be 100% efficient. Well, <laughs> well I, I, you know, one, one comment, I mean. Standard, there used to be an institute for the study of war and peace. Is that institute still in existence? Oh, and then yes, you have it wonderful it studies like it is. It is. the statistics of deadly quarrels, statistics of deadly quarrels, the frequency think, of wars. Yeah. And a number of really major works came out, and I, I don't see that area of research growing. Mm. And it, maybe one reason it isn't growing is that the funds available for research projects in the area are inadequate. Charlie, I'd you're going to get the last word. answer the question emphatically, yes. But then, you know, uh, to ask researchers and academics whether there's underinvestment in research <laughs> is like asking cardiovascular surgeons whether there's underinvestment in, in cardiovascular surgery. Uh, and the problem is that those who are in a field uh, may accurately uh, estimate the returns to that field, but they're singularly ill-equipped to estimate the opportunity costs of using the funds on something else. How do you compare the, the uh, funding of the New York uh, Philharmonic in Pyongyang last week with more research on North Korea, which I've done a lot of in the last three years? I mean, I think there's some 
you know, the, the opportunity cost question is crucial. I think we're going to have to uh, call it a, an end of the panel. Thank you all very much. We <laughs>